Amen and amen. It's so good to see so many of you this morning. We've been on the road a little bit and uh, we've gone to and fro. Some of you have been out on the sea and you made it back. Amen. amen. Ain't that all right? Ain't God all right? Many of you have been on the highways, 75, 24, various parts of the southeast and who knows, some of them may have driven all the way to California and you made it back. Be thankful. God is good. And, and never, never assume that your world is the only one that's crumbling around you. There's always somebody somewhere who's worse off than you. So be thankful. Don't mumble, don't grumble, don't complain. It won't do you any good. I've tried it all. Just be thankful to a good God who has been better to us than we could ever think about being to ourselves. Amen. Amen. The book of Exodus chapter 16. And I want to read to you verses 13, 14, and 15. The book of Exodus chapter 16 chapter 16. Many of you Sunday school students have an idea of what's going on in this text. Exodus 16 beginning at verse 13 and this is what we find in verse 13. It says, and it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp. In the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the whore frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, it is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, this is bread, which the Lord have given you to eat. Amen. You may be seated. Allow me to speak to you for just a few moments. Uh, amen. This morning from the subject, the attitude of ingratitude. The attitude of ingratitude. Let us pray. Father, open our eyes that we might see, our ears that we might hear, and our hearts that we might be able to receive what your word has to say. Teach us. Teach us the, uh, the, 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 the frugality of ingratitude. The, the lack of faith that, uh, that produces it. And help us to realize that no matter where we are in life or what we are going through in life. There's always someone suffering more. And we have been blessed beyond measure. Sometimes we take for granted just how blessed we are. So help us to have an attitude of gratitude, not ingratitude. It's in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. The attitude of ingratitude. Beloved, it is reported that a fella by the name of Matthew Arnold, you don't know who Matthew Arnold is, don't worry about it. His example is what is important. Matthew Arnold had a weakness for complaining. So all he did was complain. <coughs> Sun would be out and he said, we need rain. Rain would come and said, I'm tired of the rain, I want more sunshine. Matthew was always complaining. When he died, a neighbor quipped, Poor Matthew. He won't like God. You see, the Lord doesn't appreciate the attitude or the act of complaining, uh, primarily because complaining is representative of an attitude of ingratitude. And an attitude of ingratitude is the product of a lack of faith. Now, we as human beings have a problem. And the problem is that from time to time, we fail to be grateful to God for what he has done for us. Amen. We take for granted all of the marvelous things that he has done on our behalf, don't we? Yeah, yeah. 
when we, when we breathe his air, we assume he owes it to us. When he puts a roof over our heads, we feel uh, it, that it is the least he could do. When he puts food on our table, we act as if we have earned it. And when he gives us a car to drive, we complain that it is the wrong color. Uh, we have issues with ingratitude. But we aren't the only ones. The children of Israel also had problems with the attitude of ingratitude. And as we come to the, to the 16th chapter of Exodus, we understand that the children of Israel had been the recipients of some of the most incredible blessings given to any people. God delivered them out of Egypt following a series of backbreaking plagues. He enabled them to escape the impending doom of the roar of the unrushing Egyptian army by turning the Red Sea into a drip dry highway. He led them through the wilderness by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He gave them water to drink in the middle of a hot and arid desert. No matter the need, God met it. No matter the deficiency, God provided for it. God was faithful at every turn, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough for the children of Israel. It wasn't enough because they possessed an attitude of ingratitude. And because they did, they just kept finding something for which to complain. But despite their lack of appreciation, despite their boorish behavior, and despite their wimpish whining, God demonstrated that even when we are ungrateful, God is always faithful. Let me say it again. Even when we are ungrateful, God is always faithful. Can I get a witness of that? There are three things about the attitude of ingratitude that I want you to see this morning. First, I want you to see that the attitude of ingratitude tends to distort reality. Makes you just a little bit crazy. Verse 1 of the text tells us that Moses and the children of Israel journeyed toward a place called Elam. And there they camped. Now, we aren't told how long the Israelites stayed in Elam, but at some point after replenishing their water from the 12 wells that were located there, verse 1 says, they took their journey from Elam and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, S-I-N, which is between Elam and Sinai. Now, the wilderness or the desert of Sin was a harsh place. It contained very little vegetation and water was also scarce. It was an environment of stone and sand which made it a difficult place for all who traveled through it. But its barren surroundings made it the perfect place for God to test the faith of his people. And we know that it was a test because verse 4 says that I may prove or test them whether they will walk in my law law or not. God wanted to know if the children of Israel would be obedient. And the only way we can ever be tested is that God has allowed all of us to walk through the valley or the desert of sin. The desert of sin is hell on earth. The desert of sin can be found in a hospital bed. The desert of sin can be found down at the funeral home. The desert of sin can be found when you get a pink slip. The desert of sin can be found when your children acted like they've lost their mind. The desert of sin is any place where life is giving you all the trouble that you did not expect. Some of you in the valley of sin or the desert of sin right now, in a right? It's a place you don't want to be. But God has allowed you to go there because he must test you. He must see who and what you are and what you will do. And you need to see it as well. And test them he did. But the Israelites did not pass the test. The lack of resources in the desert of sin caused them great suffering. They were hungry. With little resources to satisfy that hunger. 
Vegetation again was scarce. Meat was too. In addition, the Israelites possessed little to no survival skills. They didn't know how to go and hunt game, and there wasn't much game out there to hunt. They were tired, hungry, and afraid, a condition that prompted them to lash out and do what they always did. Verse 2 says, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel did what? Murmured. They murmured and they complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. After only a month out of Egypt, despite all of the miraculous things the Lord had done for them, the children of Israel did what they always did best. It was, as Deke told me a minute ago, in their DNA to murmur and complain. And I have observed that murmuring tends to distort reality. And it does so in two ways. Let, and now follow me on this. First, it tends to distort the true target of our ingratitude. Who we're truly mad at. Verse 2 indicates that the children of Israel murmured and blamed Moses and Aaron, didn't it? It's y'all's fault for our dilemma. But their murmuring was a distortion of reality. Their ingratitude wasn't really against Moses and Aaron. It was against God. In verse 8, Moses indicts them when he said, The Lord had heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? We are not all-knowing. We are not all-powerful. Uh, we are not all-ever-present. We are nobody but men. Your murmuring is not against us, but against the Lord. You see, the Bible teaches that murmuring or verbally assaulting the prophet or representative of God is nothing more than rebellion against God. So the next time you unjustly go after that next preacher, you better think about that. But it's much easier, you know, to blame someone we can see as opposed to someone we cannot. Ingratitude distorts the true target of our complaining. Another distortion of ingratitude is that it tends to misrepresent the facts. Verse 3 says, And the children of Israel said unto them, What to God? We had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. We had everything in Egypt. We had chitlins and fatback and greens and, and pig's feet and, and hogs knuckles and everything we wanted. The Israelites were suffering from a case of selective amnesia. They claimed that life in Egypt was good. They claimed that the food was good in Egypt. Not just good food, but plenty of good food. So much good food that they ate to the full. Their stomachs were bursting. The truth is they were lying. They seemed to have forgotten that they were slaves in Egypt. And they were treated like slaves. Therefore, they would have been treated harshly and fed sparingly with food that was hardly fit for kings. But in order to feel justified about their complaining... They distorted the truth about their real condition in Egypt. You see, murmuring or complaining almost always leads to lies and falsehoods to justify oneself. I'm complaining. Don't really know what I'm complaining about, but I'm mad. And you, the first joke I'm going to go after, and I'm going after you. I'm going to create a reality that doesn't exist. I paid all this money in the church and you ain't given a dime and the record shows it but in your mind you think you have because you want to complain to justify your complaining but you've done nothing you sacrificed nothing you've committed to nothing but you want to open your mouth and complain it distorts reality it will not allow us to admit the truth because we don't want to look at self. Right. I want to look at everybody else. Right. <laughs> I ain't the problem. You and you and you, y'all my problems. Right. 
And if I can get y'all, all my worries will be over. Akuna Matata. In some twisted kind of way. And then they doubled down on their distortion by convincing themselves that it was better for them to have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt than for Moses and Aaron to have brought them forth into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. In other words, they claimed that dying in Egypt as slaves, where they had plenty of food to eat, which they were lying about, was far better than dying in the wilderness free, as free men. This was plain insanity. This was nothing more than fake news. Their, their attitude was unbelievable when we consider that, 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 uh, that not too long before they had uh, seen God perform miracle after miracle that allowed them to cross the Red Sea that killed Pharaoh's army. He gave them water to drink in the land of Marah. Everything they needed, God took care of. And here they are still opening up their mouths to complain. How dare they? This is what I mean when I argue that the attitude of ingratitude distorts reality. You've let your lies make you a fool. And you want to blame everybody else for your foolishness. It doesn't tell the truth. This brings me to my second point. No matter how much it distorts reality, the attitude of ingratitude can do nothing to stop the promises of God. That's because even when we are ungrateful, God is always faithful. Thank God for that. The Israelites should have been ashamed of themselves. They should have been. Instead of being ungrateful, they should have been thankful. Instead of whining, they should have been worshiping. Instead of uttering complaints from their mouths, they should have been speaking praise from their lips. They had an attitude of ingratitude, but their ingratitude couldn't stop the promises of God. God was going to bless them anyhow. I know you're not working worthy of it. I know you're not worth it. I know all you don't do is run your mouth and not do nothing, but I'm still going to bless you. Good thing I ain't God. All right. <laughs> Verse 4 says, then said the Lord unto Moses, Moses, behold, I will rain down fire and brimstone. Isn't that what he said? He said, I will rain bread from heaven for you. God instructed the Israelites to gather only what they needed on day one to day five. But on the sixth day, they were to double their in gathering in order that they wouldn't have to work on the seventh day. But the promise wasn't just for bread. It was for meat as well. It wasn't just for the good tasting uh, rolls that you get from the places you go to eat. Go to Golden Corral. I got that nice bread with the butt on it. You know, when you get the big old muffin bread and you just, you just take that butt, the butter just, just run off the side of the bread. And you say, oh, thank you, Jesus. Kawasaki Mokosaka. Don't you do it? Yeah, you do it. But it wasn't just for bread. You're going to get some steak with it. You're going to get some chicken, some quail. Ain't God all right? <laughs> they were going to get meat as well. Verse 8 says, Moses, tell the people. Tell them the Lord shall in the evening give you flesh to eat. And in the morning, bread to the full. Ah, oh, despite their ingratitude, God promises to feed the Israelites bread and meat from heaven. That's a good God. You see, God's promises were greater than our faults. And thank heaven that they are. Because we don't always do as we ought, do we? We don't. We fail sometimes, don't we? We take too much for granted, don't we? But despite our failures, God has promised to help us anyhow. He promised Abraham and Sarah a son, even in their old age. And even though Abraham and Sarah disobeyed God with Hagar, God kept his promise. He promised you're going to have a son, and Isaac was born. Didn't he do it? Yes, he did. Even though we forsake him, God promises to never leave us nor forsake us. 
Isn't God all right? God not only makes his promises to us, but he delivers on them. That's because the attitude of ingratitude can't stop the provision of God. Not only promises, but he comes through. From verses 13 to 15, listen to what it says. And it came to pass that at evening the quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning the dew lay round about the camp. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, Is it manna? For they would not know what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. He came through. Just as the Lord promised, he provided meat for dinner. And just as he promised, he provided bread for breakfast. The Jews didn't recognize the bread. They had never seen it before. And that's why they said, this is manna, which means we don't know what this stuff is. But Moses identifies the substance as the bread from heaven. Bread that can come only from the hand of God. Oh, ain't he all right? But even though they didn't know what it was, it was good. Oh, taste and see. That the Lord is good. Ain't God good? Yes, Yes, when the dew receded, when the moisture of the morning evaporated, all that was left there were these small, thin, circular wafers of sweet bread. It was like a miniature flat cinnamon roll or or a honey bun. All I needed was, if I were there, was a cup of coffee or a glass of milk. It was good eating. And for the next 40 years, God provided for Israel in the wilderness. He provided the quail for dinner and the sweet bread for breakfast. Every morning and every evening, the Lord was faithful and he provided. In fair weather and foul, the Lord provided. No matter the length of the journey, the Lord provided. Despite their attitude of ingratitude the Lord provided that's because uh, the attitude of ingratitude can't stop the provision of God ain't God all right won't he take care of you won't he provide when you're down to your last dime won't he show up and show out I'm a witness yes I am I've got to leave you now But one of the things I I hope to truly learn before I leave this world is not to be a complainer. I don't want to be a mumbler. I want to be just like the Apostle Paul who said, I have learned to be content in whatever state I find myself in. We need to appreciate what we have because there's always somebody who's worse off than you I don't want to be a grumbler I don't want to be a complainer I want I don't want an attitude of ingratitude but instead I want to be like Reverend Paul Jones who wrote and said I've had some good days I've had some hills to climb I've had some weary days and some sleepless nights but when I look around and I think things over all of my good days outweigh my bad days and I won't complain you might as well go with me here God has been good to me more than this old world or you could ever be he dried all my tears away Turn my midnight into day. So I'll just say, thank you, Lord, when I'm sick and can't get well. Thank you, Lord, when I'm lying on, buked and scorned, talked about as sure as born. I said, thank you, Lord, when I'm disappointed. I say, thank you, Lord, when my friends turn their backs on me. I say, thank you, Lord, when the doctor shakes his head and walks away. I say, thank you, Lord, 
when I didn't get that promotion. I, I said, thank you, Lord. I, I won't complain. How can I complain when I have a God in heaven who smiles upon me each and every day of my life? I can't help but to get up in the morning and look outside the window and say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the trees. Thank you for the birds. Thank you for the flowers. Then I go back into my kitchen and I open up the refrigerator door. Got meat in there. I got milk in there. And I say, thank you. Yeah. Oh, my Lord. Go to the cupboard. Oh, yes, I do. Open up the door. Bread. All kinds of bread that I can eat. Yeah. I don't want to be a mumbler. I don't want to be a complainer. Because every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord. You got to realize it's all right. It's okay to stand on your feet and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Looked in the bedroom. My children were all right. Looked to my left. There was my wife. All I could do is say, Thank you, Lord. Then I put on my clothes. I could still get in them. Thank you, Jesus. Got the keys to my car. Went on down. Closed the door. Started it up. It started running. I started driving down the road. Put my hand up. Thank you. I got a car to drive. Thank you. I got clothes on my body. Thank you. Food on my table. Thank you, Lord. Y'all might look cute, but you might not see me no more. But if I leave this world tonight, I don't have no regrets. I don't have no remorse. I realize I'm a blessed man. I realize God has provided. I realize that he sent his son on the train of time down through 40 and two generations. Stopped off at Bethlehem. Born in a major, wrapped in swaddling clothes. Came a time to preach, time to teach. Yeah, came his time to die. But that's not the end of the story. Early, early, yes, early. Sunday morning, he got up and stood up on a resurrection ground. All power in heaven and earth is in my hand when he said those words I knew I was a winner when he said those words I knew I had the victory when he said those words Satan will have to flee when he said those words God will God will yeah, take care of me hadn't he take care of you didn't he watch over you last night well, the reason you here this morning, didn't he bring you? Didn't he care for you? Why don't you say thank you, Lord? Wave your hand. Yeah. Yeah, Lord. I'm going to have to retire soon. Don't be ungrateful. Don't spend 90% of your time in your life whining, complaining, fault finding, pointing the finger at everybody else. When in fact, oftentimes, the biggest devil we'll ever see is in the mirror. Be thankful. Be grateful. He's made a way out of no way. Come on, choir, and tell that story.